Hello, my name is James Baroud, and I'm pleased to introduce Jack Stanley, curator of the Thomas Edison Museum in Menlo Park, New Jersey. Hi, this is Jack Stanley. I'm the curator of the Thomas Edison Menlo Park Museum here in Edison, New Jersey. The Menlo Park Laboratory that once stood here is very, very important in our history. This was the location of the world's first organized research laboratory. That was Edison's concept, Edison's idea, Edison's invention. It really didn't exist before. Edison understood his limitations, and so he added to this organization to help him to realize things he did not quite understand. And in this grouping, you had mathematicians, scientists, physicists, engineers, laborers, mechanics, and this collective unit was Thomas Edison. I've often looked at it this way, that the brilliance of Edison was this, that he was an amazingly smart, brilliant individual. But the brilliance of Edison was more than that. He was brilliant enough to realize he wasn't brilliant enough. And that's brilliant. And so he surrounded himself with this amazing array of individuals and this collective unit was Thomas Edison. And Menlo Park would become one of the greatest periods of research in the history of man. In the space of only seven years, nearly 400 patents. There's nothing quite like that historically. Think of what they worked on here. They perfected the telephone came up with a carbon button transmitter, worked on the phonograph, invented the phonograph. In fact, that was Edison's favorite invention, referred to it as my baby. How it was developed is an interesting story. It, it goes back a bit. It actually deals with something called the automatic telegraph repeater, which Edison was working on, which was a device to capture the indentations of incoming telegraph messages. He discovered if the needle rubbed against the dots and dashes of that recording, it would create almost voice-like qualities. Also, while working with the telephone mouthpiece, he discovered that speaking in the mouthpiece, it caused vibration and you could feel the vibration. In fact, a needle holding the diaphragm in place in the telephone mouthpiece would prick his finger when he would yell into it. This started Edison thinking about possibly taking sound and trying to capture it. He theorized that perhaps one could speak into such a diaphragm with a needle onto a surface and by speaking indent that surface with the vibrations of sound and then take those vibrations and recreate sound. What an amazing concept. And so they did work starting in July of 1877 working through until December of 1877. And on December 6, 1877, Edison makes the first official recording, which is Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, onto what we call the tinfoil phonograph. It was an amazing moment in history. One might say, perhaps, one of the greatest moments of Edison's life, because he had done something that was considered impossible. People theorized it was impossible. People didn't believe that you could capture sound because it was of the ether, it was of the air, it wasn't something tangible. The next day, Edison is on the train for New York City with his phonograph, with a pre-recorded message on it. And as Edison liked to tell the story, he said he went to the offices of Scientific American, went to the office of the editor, plopped the Edison phonograph on the editor's desk, turned the crank, and the phonograph introduced itself to the editor. Asked to the editor's health, told the editor it was feeling fine, and bade the editor a fond good day. Now what a great way to introduce a machine that talks by letting the machine that talks introduce itself. That's genius, that's theater, that's Thomas Edison. The editor writes about it, People come to see Edison. Edison becomes an international celebrity. In fact, Edison becomes known as the Wizard of Menlo Park because of the phonograph.
Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone. It had issues, it didn't work that well, although it was an amazing device. I mean, it was the star of the centennial celebration in Philadelphia of 1876. It had some problems. It really didn't have much of an amplification system. You spoke into one piece and you listened with that same piece. In many respects, it was very much like two cans with string. Edison loved to make fun of Alexander Graham Bell and his apparatus, as he liked to call it. He said, when you use Bell's apparatus, you have to go talk to the person you spoke to. And, uh, well, that basically gave you the idea of what he thought of it. And if you called Bell in 1876, in those days, he would answer his phone by saying, hoy, hoy. Edison didn't like hoy, hoy. Edison didn't like Bell. Bell didn't like Edison. Actually, Edison and Bell are basically the same age. They're more than three months apart from each other. And to use the statement that was used by Theodore Roosevelt's daughter, each one wanted to be the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. And so Edison, when he opens the facility here, one of the things that they go to work on right away is developing what we call the carbon button transmitter, the mouthpiece for the telephone. Made the telephone practical. Now what I find most interesting about this is the fact that they developed the system and Edison sells it for a great deal of money to Bell's competitor. And then Edison develops his greeting for the telephone. Perhaps one of the least known facts about Thomas Edison. And that word is hello. Edison is the inventor of the word hello. With incandescent lighting, it's a very, very important thing with Edison. You know, we, we lose track uh, in this day and age of how amazing that development was. What was lighting in the 19th century? You had candles, kerosene, whale oil, and gas. Now think about it. Candles, well, they were pretty good. They were, out, out of the bunch, they were pretty much the best in many respects. You know, gas was a little noisy and also quite dangerous. Kerosene could easily be knocked over and burn down your house. And whale oil stunk to high heaven. And so once the incandescent light was developed by Edison and his team, lighting became something very, very different. Suddenly, our days were longer, our productivity increased. Uh, our lifestyle changed totally because of that incandescent light. But what did they end up using as a filament for the incandescent light? You know, lots of times people think, well, Edison developed the tungsten light bulb. Well, no, he didn't. They tried tungsten. It wasn't very successful. They tried different materials. In fact, what would eventually work and become successful as the commercial filament for the incandescent light for Thomas Edison was bamboo. Carbonized bamboo from Yowata City, Japan. There are monuments all over Yowata City, Japan to Thomas Edison. Um, it seems interesting because in Asian culture, Bamboo reflects evil, and every temple was surrounded with bamboo. And the best bamboo they could find was in Yowata City surrounding a temple. And Edison stuck with bamboo for a long time. It was an amazingly resilient uh, material. They could get up to 1,400 hours out of a bamboo filament light bulb. That's not bad. They used DC as an electric power source. Edison liked DC. He was not fond of AC, which is what we use today. I think there's several issues for that. First off, it was a safety issue. AC is quite dangerous. It still is in many respects. Um, DC had its limitations, however. Transmission. It would go for about a half a mile, 